Well, good morning. Welcome to Christ Fellowship Eastside. We're so glad that you've chosen to gather with us today uh, to worship God for He's worthy of our praise this morning. At Christ Fellowship Eastside, we uh, seek to multiply disciples to the glory of God by living connected, sharing good news, and pursuing Christ. And that's what we want to do this morning. We want to sing songs that reflect praise and glory to Him. We'll read scripture that will uh, encourage our hearts and, and amplify the praise that we give to Him. We'll spend time enjoying one another, talking, fellowshipping, carrying each other's burdens, getting to know each other, and of course hearing from God's Word, all those things leading towards the ultimate glory of our Savior who's worthy this morning for our praise. So thank you so much for being here. We're so glad that you've gathered with us. If you are a first-time visitor, thank you for coming. Uh, we'd like to connect with you further. So if you got a Connect card on your way in, um, and if not, we can get you one of those, and you don't mind filling that out, we'd love to connect with you, get a chance to get to know you later, um, and just see how we can come alongside you and be an encouragement to you and, and, and talk about um, how you might fit here at Christ Fellowship Eastside. We're so glad that you're here. We have a small gift in the back for you as well. Uh, so thank you so much for gathering with us. I'm going to pray, uh, and, and when I finish, we'll get right into our singing. God, we love you so much. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your grace towards us. Lord, that goodness and kindness and grace was demonstrated most uh, uh, clearly and, and fully in the gospel and the, coming, and the sending of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. Lord, would you just fill our hearts with hope and encouragement this morning that those who are fe feeling weary and, and down um, and heavy-hearted would be lifted and encouraged by spending time with your people and time in your word and by singing praise to you. God, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you stand together as we sing, church? We have everything we need in Jesus Christ. We'll sing of that this morning. I can sing with my whole heart. I have all I need. In Jesus, my Savior, my joy is complete. Onward to glory, and here I will wait. I will trust in Christ every step I take. Amen. You can be sure of His promise. I am sure of your promise to guide me each day. Though some may oppose me, I won't be ashamed. Whatever I face, Lord, it won't be in vain. I will trust in Christ every step I take. For all of my days, I will live for your glory, running with courage and faith. The prize of my journey, the joy. to Jesus, perfecter of faith. My heart set on heaven where treasures await. I'll run with endurance to finish the race. I will trust in Christ every step I take. For all of my days I will live for your glory, running with courage and faith. You're faithful to save. I will, I will rejoice. I know that God is with me always. Sing, I will. I will, I will rejoice. Whatever comes my way, God, you're faithful to save. I will, I will rejoice. I know that God is with me always. Yes, I will, I will, I will rejoice. Whatever comes my way, God, you're faithful to save. I will, I will rejoice. I know that God is with me always. All of my days I will live for your glory, running with courage and faith. 
name and praise this morning, church. Sing, let the glory of the Lord forever be our joy. The glory of the Lord forever be our joy. May redemption be the theme of our song. For by grace we have been saved, and by grace we shall proclaim to the corners of the earth that Christ is come. this morning. I appreciate you singing so well of the hope that not just we have here in this place, but across the world as God brings to himself a people from every tribe and nation and tongue, and we celebrate in unity in the gospel. I love that so much. 
want to read a, a passage from me from Acts chapter 4. Uh, we find Peter and John, and they're entering the temple to teach, and they've, they've come across the man who was lame from birth, and, and the Spirit quickens Peter to be able to heal this man, which of course caused a major stir among the people. And so we find Peter and John on trial before the council. And listen to these words of Peter. He says, or it says, Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And we'll continue worshiping this morning by declaring together, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. is built my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest friend but only trust in Jesus would you sing just that much again? My hope, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Every storm, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within me. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone. We. In the Savior's love. 
he shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone for less to stand before the throne just take a moment thank him for the gospel Christ alone. to do something that uh, we've done before. Uh, we don't do it often, uh, but I think it's a good practice, and that is to read Scripture responsively. Uh, we're going to work our way through Psalm 145 this morning. I'll read what's in white, and if you would read out aloud together the text that is in yellow, and we'll work our way through this psalm. Just try not to get distracted by the form uh, of this back and forth. Nothing unusual or strange there, more just a tool to allow us to plug into Scripture in, in a way that's collaborative, in a way that's um, expressing unity together as we pursue Christ in this way here this morning. So I'll read what's in white, and you guys echo back. Psalm 145 says, I exalt you, my God, the King. Bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and ever. I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty and your wondrous works. They will proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts, and I will declare your greatness. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. All you have made will thank you, Lord. The faithful will bless you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and will declare your might, informing all people of your mighty acts and of the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all his acts. The Lord is near to all who call out to him, all who call out to him with integrity. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry for help and saves them. The Lord guards all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. I invite you to stand once again as we continue this morning. Your 
mercy never fails me all my days i've been held in your hand the moment that i wake up until i lay my head i will see of the goodness of god sing all my life Good God, this morning, lift your voice and sing all my life. church. God, we love you and praise you for your goodness and your greatness. Lord, we're so unworthy to even know you, much less to have relationship with you, but your love sent Christ to die for us for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could have hope, so that we could have relationship with you. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We want to know more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
morning, church. I'm Phil, one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship Eastside. And uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at the, the issue of spiritual distance, distance from God. And whether it's something that you can look back on a time in your life where you were very close to God at one point, and now something has changed. Or maybe you're kind of in those beginning steps of a relationship with God, and you're wondering, is this ever going to change? This is something that is a constant thread, a constant topic, something that I end up talking with a lot of people uh, throughout their lives. And, and the way I think about this experience is similar to one that occurred to me when I was, uh, was a teenager. I was visiting this island called St. Kitts. St. Kitts is in the West End. It's a beautiful little island, and uh, there I was visiting with a uh, missionary kid that I had developed a friendship with. We were emailing a lot over those years, and uh, we started chatting via this thing called AOL Instant Messenger. Um, for, for you youngsters in the room, this is like the prehistoric version of like iMessages and WhatsApp. So um, if, to, to use it, you had to tie up the family's one phone line. Um, so no calls in and out from mom and dad. That, that surely would go over really well. Um, and it would take about five minutes to initiate a conversation. They also had to be sitting at a computer. It wouldn't come to a device in their hands, and then, and then you had a, a certain bucket of minutes that would arrive via CD-ROM, uh, very, very complicated sort of technology. It's very fascinating stuff, I'll clue you in, but you know, ancient times, ancient times. So uh, anyway, I developed this friendship, and, uh, and, and as a result, kind of went over to, to visit him. It was my first time leaving the country. It was my first time um, going, going uh, on, on a flight by myself. In fact, it was my first time even flying commercial that I could remember. I think I may have flown with my mom when I was a very small child. Uh, so a very jarring experience, but incredibly rewarding. So we spent a lot of time exploring the, the old city there, I explored an old fort and climbed around it. Uh, found, found this like really dark room that I could hide out in and stuff, and we played hide and go seek in this old Spanish fort. It was really cool. And then we went and sp spent some time at the beach doing some snorkeling. It was my first time ever snorkeling, and so I fell, followed my friend Stephen out uh, onto the reefs, and we were going for a while. And it didn't seem like that long, but then suddenly I uh, poked my head up and realized that we were very far from shore. Um, and of course, for Stephen, he had been doing this his whole life. He was a very confident swimmer. It was no problem. He just turns and starts making his way back to shore. But for me, I've never been a good swimmer. Uh, that, you know, as, as a kid, I always hate, hated getting water in my face, all this. And, and so I am freaking out. Uh, and, and it was everything in me to not start flailing about and screaming and all kinds of stuff. And, and just kind of, I, I knew, okay, I've got the snorkel. I can, I can go ahead and just slowly start making my way to shore. And little by little, and I just remember that sense of relief as I'm looking down through the snorkel goggles and see the, the ground rising up, and I know, okay, I can finally put my feet down. I'm okay. And I think that our walk with God sometimes has those kinds of experiences um, where it's easy to get distracted and suddenly look up, and we're much farther away from God than we had imagined that something has come between us and God, and there is this distance that's taken place. And it's hard not to start freaking out and flailing about for a way out. And that's what we're going to see in 1 Samuel chapter 14 as we turn there this morning and continue this study in 1 Samuel. We're going to see a series of behaviors from King Saul that demonstrate that there is distance between him and God. In fact, uh, we, we kind of were clued into this from last week. Rodney pointed out all the way back in verse 3, the previous section of this chapter, we had this, this instance that kind of sign, gives us the sign that something is off with Saul and his relationship with God. He's got this priest with him, which you might think on the surface, wow, okay, he's got a priest. That must be a sign of something good. Something is, is happening here. But if you look closely at verse 3, it says, Abijah, or Ahijah, who was wearing the ephod, was also there. He was the son of Ahitub, the brother of Ichabod, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the Lord's priest at Shiloh. Um, something is off here, because if, if you're tracking with the storyline, the first three chapters, you're supposed to be thinking, the priests are done. Eli's line is done. Something is over with this line of priests. And yet, suddenly, there's this priest showing up 
at Saul's side. What, what are we supposed to make of this? You have a, a priestly line of Eli that's done, that's finished. And then we have this kingly line of Saul that's done, that's finished. These two guys that are hanging out that are, that are all about a bunch of nothingness. They, uh, this priest follows in the line of Ichabod, Mr. Inglorious himself. It's a failed, dead line. So Saul has surrounded himself by this empty formalism of religion and has abandoned the divine revelation that was coming through Samuel. He's distanced himself from this character Samuel, where God's revelation was coming as a conduit through him. So Saul finds himself spiritually distant from God and chasing what we see in this first half of the chapter is his son's victory. His son was seeing great strides and following after God and seeing the enemy push back, and so Saul is kind of following in the footsteps of his son, oddly enough. So it's a, it's a jarring story of, of this spiritual distance that is set in. And, and before we really work our way through that text, I mean, it, it's important to catch this stuff early on. Uh, I, I think of it this way, too. I, um, went to that physical uh, doctor's appointment uh, for, I don't know, it's supposed to be a yearly thing. Laurel had to set it up for me. Um, it, it had been a couple of years, and so I go in, and basically going, going for a yearly physical is basically I'm paying someone to tell me uh, what I could just ask my wife, and she would frankly tell me, which is that I'm getting old and fat. Um, and so, so I go in there, and... Uh, he, he added some extra value this time. He said, uh, Phil, you know, not too long. You're going to be coming in, and, you know, you'll be over 45, and, you know, your doctor's visits are going to be getting more involved. And I, uh, I will never think of the word involved in the same way again. Um, and, and he said, you know, and, and as, a, as a result, we're going to have to take a closer look at some of your, your numbers and things like that. And, you know, what, what looks like fine numbers right now in your late 30s is, is going to be a real big problem later on down the line. Uh, it's it's going to be something that we're going to have to take more seriously. And I guess, you know, forewarned is forearmed, but uh, it still was, was not an enjoyable visit at all. But in, in some ways, we... We do take seriously what's going on with our physical condition. We, we look at our physical heart and say, you know, I need to take steps now before this gets out of hand and do things now that are preventative so that I'm not uh, in, in some kind of catastrophic situation five years, ten years down the line. But yet, sometimes we don't take that same kind of inventory of our spiritual heart to look at our own spiritual state before God and say, you know, what, what are some things that might indicate that I'm, I'm going in a direction that's going to take me way off course, 5, 10, 15 years down the line? So, in this passage, we're just going to see a number of marks in this passage of distance from God. And these are things that we can use as kind of a self-diagnostic to look at, you know, wh what's going on in my heart and in my life. So, starting, and uh, let's read verses 23 and 24, and we'll just work our way down through the passage. It says, so the Lord saved Israel that day. The battle extended far uh, beyond beth -Avon, and the men of Israel were worn out that day, for Sa Saul had placed the troops under an oath. The man who eats food before evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies, is cursed, so none of the troops tasted any food. Notice first, the first mark that we see here is uh, a mark of spiritual distance is when I become consumed with my own ambition. Notice the words of Saul's oath here. He says, the man who eats food before evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies, is cursed. There's this classic narcissistic egocentrism in these words that he speaks here in front of his men. This isn't, he, he's not seeking vengeance for God. He's not looking out to, to take out God's enemies. He's looking to take vengeance for himself. He's looking to take out Saul's enemies. That's his focus. That's his orientation. He's become blinded by his own agenda. And, and as we ask these questions of ourselves, I think, you know, even just practically, take out your calendar from last week and look at all of the different things that you did with your time throughout the past week. Look at the different priorities that those represent, the things that you did because you had to do, the things that you did because you wanted to do them, all the things that you did during your free time. How does, how does that represent your priorities in life, the things that you're driving after, the things that compel you forward? Be brutally honest. And if you had to write down the three things based on your calendar, your agenda of last week, that drive your life, 
what would those three things be? And would there be any space for God in those three? Have, have the agendas, the priorities of your life pushed out any room for God when you make an honest self-assessment? Second thing we see is uh, that, that we can begin to rely on our willpower for success. Here again in verse 24, there is uh, this, this oath that Saul places upon his men. Notice he, he doesn't come to God with a plea for success. He's not going to God in prayer saying, Lord, please help us win the battle today. He's saying that how I'm going to achieve victory is to, to buckle down with these guys. We're going to make this really difficult on them. He binds his men with an oath for success. It's basically a uh, this is the way or a for Sparta or to the death kind of, you know, cheer for his guys. You know, he, he's trying to rally the troops in, in a very human and natural way, but it's not the way that we see, for example, Joshua leading the people into the land, rallying them around the, the, the commands and, and uh, glory of God and his call to the people. He doesn't do that. He sets that aside, and he's going to rally the way that the nations around him, the kings around him would do. Pick up on that theme, right? And so, he makes his priority around his man-made laws rather than the law of God. And there is an extent to which if you buckle down and use raw willpower to get things done, you'll get things done. You'll make some progress. And Saul makes some progress with his guys. I mean, he takes them through, and they actually do have a measure of success on the battlefield. They beat some of the bad guys. But what the text actually seems to indicate here is that the, the total route of the Philistine hangs by a thread. What Jonathan has started in the first half of this chapter was about to be a complete and total annihilation of the Philistines. But instead, what happens is a marginal victory under Saul. They don't completely rout the enemy. Instead, what they do is they win a small battle. And so, just in a similar way, uh, when you're relying on willpower to ex expand your walk with God, to grow in your morality and so on, you might press back the enemy. You might win some short-term victories, but you will never rout the enemy. You will never see complete and total victory because, again, instead of relying on God's plan to deal with the Philistine threat and leaning on God's support and God's wisdom, Saul has chosen his own playbook, and the result, it ends up in a bunch of infighting as we see at the, as we progress down through the chapter. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, have I become distant from God because I've inserted my own methods to achieve success in life? My own morality is something that's purely derived from my own self-effort, the things that I try to do to earn the attention of God, to earn His favor on my behalf. If you test yourself in that way and you, and you want to know, like, am I living out of, of my own strength, of my own willpower, uh, I, would, I would just ask the, the test if... if um, you know, do I go through life living like these soldiers of Saul? They're starved, they're, they're sapped of energy, they're struggling, and, and, and eventually have to give up the chase. Is that me? Does that look like my life? The third thing that we see is, is that he assumes the worst about others. Uh, and, and this is very subtle in the passage. Why on earth would Saul need to bind his men with an oath? He, he has to do that because he has to believe somewhere deep down that his guys really don't want the victory as much as he does. They're not going to press through the challenges. They're not going to really do the hard things that are necessary to push back these enemies. So how am I going to achieve this? I've got to put a death wish on, on them if, if they don't go through with the plan. I mean, do, do, you, do you see how insidious this is? You know, I, I as well tend to think the worst about others when I'm at my worst personally. You know, in fact, this, this may even be something that comes out of a necessity when you're operating in a place of sheer willpower. You know, when you're trying to claw your way to the moral high ground, when you're trying to fight for some kind of spiritual breakthrough on your own, and you're trying to do that on your own merits and in, in, under your own efforts, then, then you have to then prove to yourself that you're morally superior to, the, uh, to those around you. You're the only one that's really, truly following God because you're, you're having to work at this. You're having to claw your way forward. And somehow everyone else around me has bad motives. I'm the only one that's got the pure motives in this scenario. You can see that subtly working its way into Saul's heart here. 
The next section we'll read is in verse 25 and following. It says, everyone went into the forest, and there was honey on the ground. When the troops entered the forest, they saw the flow of honey, but none of them ate any of it because they feared the oath. However, Jonathan had not heard his father make the troops swear the oath. He reached out with the end of his staff he was carrying and dipped it into the honeycomb. When he ate the honey, he had renewed energy. Then one of the troops said, your father make, made the troops solemnly swear, the man who eats food today is cursed, and the troops are exhausted. The next thing that we see here is that uh, when, when we find distance from God, we, we begin to reject His good gifts. Uh, it, one, one rule of Bible study is, is pay attention to key words that are repeated and, and things that are odd and significant, uh, even simple words like the word honey. Where on earth have we seen this word honey in the Old Testament before? Well, um, throughout the Old Testament, there was this promise that God would lead His people into a land that was flowing with what? Milk and honey. There was, there was some characteristic of the land that he's saying, he's highlighting there and saying, this is, this, this is a mark of my grace. This is a mark of my goodness to you, that you enter into this place that has these characteristics. And so, he, he, he gives them this land that, that has this uh, overflowing nature of grace within it. And yet, there the soldiers find themselves, surrounded by God's goodness and God's grace, and are unable to partake of it unable to enjoy God's goodness to them. They have to pass it by. So, when we, when we become untethered from God and our hearts start to drift, we become unthankful toward God. We, we are unable to find thankfulness in our hearts. We find it hard to be happy. We even find His very blessings unbearable. So, the question here would be, you know, do, do I have a thankful heart? Am I able to take stock of God's goodness and God's blessing in my life and, and count it for what it is? Or do I have to pass by like the soldiers with a hungry belly? Next thing we'll see comes in, in verses 29 and 30. Jonathan replied, my father has brought trouble to the land. Just look at how I have renewed energy because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the troops had eaten freely today from the plunder they took from the enemies then the slaughter of the Philistines would have been much greater. You see here this, um, this frustration under the, uh, those who are under Saul's care. You know, when, when, when we begin to drift away from God, those who we are charged with the responsibility to care for, to steward, to see that they advance their gifts, are the ones that end up suffering some of the most harm. Now, unlike the old other soldiers, Jonathan doesn't know that there's been this oath, and so he unknowingly partakes of the honey. He enjoys the blessings of God only to be rebuked by those who are around him. And Jonathan's response here is telling him that we're, we're beginning to see this divide between Jonathan and Saul, this, this separation that's, that's going to end them up in, in some vast, different, vastly different trajectories, but actually all both in the same place when they end up meeting their fate. I do find it odd, you know, Saul, instead of supporting his son, instead of supporting what we've seen in the first half of this chapter, his son's devotion to God, his, his willingness to pursue the things of God, Saul ends up squashing his son indirectly. He frustrates his son. It reminds me of the verse from Ephesians that says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You know, there's, there's a way to exasperate the noble desires of the next generation. You know, I, I would say we, we often fixate on one of the two twin tragedies. And I mentioned one of them last week. We have the tragedy of deconstruction, where the next generation is raised up under, under parents that are trying to put them around the things of God and follow God and so on. And, and then the, that next generation says, you know, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. And they walk away, and, and they end up shaking their fist at all the things that they had grown up around and reject it. And so, so that's the, the tragedy of deconstruction. I, I would say there, there's an often missed other second tra tragedy, and that is the tragedy of false construction. And that is that, uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of parents or uh, leaders in churches and so on that have a relationship with God that is really functionally an empty shell in comparison to those that they lead. I think about a um, number of teens, college students, so on, that I've talked to, 
And they have a willingness to follow God. They are ready to make big sacrifices for the call of God, to do great things for the kingdom. And, and in those cases, sometimes stand head and shoulders above the parents that raised them, uh, those, those who uh, lead and nurture them in different contexts. And, and instead, they, they show this desire to pursue God in an extreme way. And in fact, some, in some cases, it's even the parents that throw roadblocks in their way of following God. I say parents, teachers, leaders, friends, don't exasperate those under your care who want to follow God, who are, who are following God and in, in, in trying to chase after His will for their lives. Do you exasperate them through your own spiritual negligence, or do you equip them for the next phase of their journey? The next thing we see shows up in verses 31 and 32. It says, the Israelites struck down the Philistines that day from Michmash all the way to Aijalon. Since the Israelites were completely exhausted, they rushed to the plunder, took the sheep, goats, cattle, calves, slaughtered them on the ground, and ate the meat with the blood still in it. Uh, some reported to Saul, look, the troops are sinning against the Lord by eating meat with the blood still in it. Uh, we, we see in this case that uh, distance from God leads us to magnify the pull of temptation. Um, in this case, in the lives of others, and in some cases, in our own lives as well. Um, it, it should be really no shock that since Saul has put his troops under such duress of his man-made rules and regulations, and because they weren't able to partake of the goodness of God, that then when they're placed in a place of temptation, of pressure, they quickly cave under it. The men under King Saul leap on the plunder and eat the animals with the blood. Uh, I, I think of this in, in terms of, you know, there, there is a general disgust that most people have with eating raw meat. I think that's, that's very natural. I remember I um, was on a business trip through Europe and ended up in the city of Strasbourg, and this was before uh, connections were very easy over smartphones, and you could Google Translate your way through anything. And so I ended up at this restaurant, and they put a menu in front of me, and I'm just looking through this, and I don't know a lick of French at that point. And I'm scanning through this, and I see the word boof, and I'm like, I know what that is. Beef. Good. Going to eat it. So the, the waiter comes over, and I said, I want that. And he goes, okay. So he, he runs off, and he brings back this plate that, no, kid, no kidding, it's, it's um, ground beef, just raw, like right on the plate. My, my wife somehow knew what this thing was, but uh, there were there occasional marks in that that would indicate that maybe it had been like lightly thrown in a pan and right onto the plate, um, but, but very, just on a very natural level, just very disturbing. And, uh, and then he looks at me and goes, ah, American, I take it back. <laughs> So he brought back a hamburger at the end of that. So yes, um, there there is a natural disgust to uh, eating raw meat. Um, even those of you who who enjoy a good rare steak, um, there, there's there's something very disturbing here. But but for the people of Israel, there's even another level to it because see they, they were commanded by God that they couldn't eat meat that had blood in it. There was something about the 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 sacrifices to God and so on that that really marked this out as something very different. This is something that they should not do. Every Israelite man knew this was something that was very very taboo. So not just disturbing, but actually sinful. So Saul had placed his own man-made rules front and center for these people, driving them then to, to the situation where they're tempted to break God's rule. And so it is with us when we're flailing about without that spiritual proximity to God, and we end up trying to find our own methods back to God, we end up manufacturing a type of holiness that crowds out true holiness. We're left fighting sin with the same tools that drive us to sin. It's a question for you. Do, you. do you feel that sense of magnified temptation through your own efforts? The next thing that we see is, uh, comes in verses 33 down to 37. It's actually kind of a funny scenario. I'll pick up in verse 34. It says, He then said, Go among the troops and say to them, Let each man bring me his ox or a sheep. Do the slaughtering here, then you can eat. Don't sin against the Lord by eating meat with the blood in it. So every one of the troops brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had built an altar to the Lord. 
Saul said, let's go down after the Philistines tonight and plunder them until morning. Don't let any one of them remain. Do whatever you want, the troops replied. No, not very encouraging. But the priest said, let's approach God here. So Saul inquired of God, should we go after the Philistines? Will you hand them over to Israel? But God did not answer him that day. Um, it's, it's almost a, this humorous scenario where his, his guys clearly are like, they're, they're done. <laughs> they're calling it quits with, with Saul. Like, whatever, just, just do what you want. We'll, we'll follow along, I guess. We don't really have any other choice in this matter. And, and Saul's like, yeah, let's, let's go lead the charge down the hill, and we're going to do this thing. And the priest goes, oh, you know, have, have we prayed at all about this? Um, well, Yes, exactly. That was exactly what I was thinking. Um, those of you who, who, you know, your five-year-old may, may occasionally do that, you know, are, are we going to pray before dinner? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, never been in that spot before, I'm sure. Um, but, but yeah, called, called on the carpet of his own, um, you know, missed opportunity to pursue God in this scenario and to pursue God's wisdom. Uh, you, you get the sense that Saul's devotion to God is completely unnatural. It's very forced. It's, it's something that has to be compelled by those around him, by this pseudo-priest that's hanging out with him. And, and even in, this, in the response to Samuel, if you remember from the last chapter, he said he felt forced to have to do this, this sacrifice to God. It's very unnatural for him. The altar, it says, was the first he had ever built. You know, following God was not a natural direction for him. I think we're meant to see a contrast here between Saul's kind of forced religiosity and Jonathan's kind of natural sense of following God's direction in his life, his natural and free walk with God. You, you see throughout the first half of this chapter so many just intuitive assumptions on the base, uh, Jonathan makes on the basis of who he knows God to be and what his revealed word says. And he just makes the right decisions and follows God's prompting and God's leading just intuitively like a fish in water. And where we see here Saul, this bumbling fish out of water. The next thing we see comes in uh, verse 37 to 40. Again, this um, key verse, I think, in, in this section here. It says, so Saul inquired of, the God, sh uh, of God, shall I go after the Philistines? Will you hand them over to Israel? But God did not answer him that day. Saul said, all you leaders of the troops, come here. Let us investigate how this sin has occurred today. As surely as the Lord lives who saves Israel, even if it is because of my son Jonathan, he will not die. Uh, he must die. Not one of the troops answered him. So he said to all Israel, you will be on my side, and I and my son Jonathan will be on the other side. And all the troops replied, do whatever you want. <laughs> um, the, this, you, you see in, in Saul this kind of, I, I'm going to manhandle this situation. I've been embarrassed because uh, God didn't answer in the way that I was expecting. And so he, he begins to shift to his own authority. He gets testy because he's embarrassed. Um, he, he is left to his own devices and to those devices he relies. And, and, and so you see this assumption even in Saul where, you know, the real problem is not necessarily with the violation of God's commands. The, the real problem must have been that somebody violated my command. You, know, you, you can see kind of this backward thinking that, that he has in the way that he addresses this. The real problem is with the violation of the oath. So I'm going to start by cleaning house with those who broke my command. And then, in the process, we'll figure out what really happened here. He asserts his feeble authority and demands unearned respect. You know, one of, one of the first things you'll notice as you begin to pull away from God, the most significant person in the universe, is that you'll begin to attribute to yourself the status of being the most significant person in the universe. Um, humble people are not people who find themselves distant from God. It's always arrogant people. It's always prideful people that find distance between themselves and God. There's uh, no one who ever drifts too far from God who thinks too little of themselves. So, uh, when you find yourselves in, in, in a spot where you're, you're pressing on other people to, you know, respect my authority, uh, you're in a dangerous place in life. So this is, this is yet another one of those tests to, to examine. Verses 41 to 43, we see what happens here with Jonathan. So Saul said to the Lord, God of Israel, why have you not answered your servant to this day? If the unrighteousness is in me or in my son Jonathan, Lord God of Israel, give Urim. But if the fault is in your people Israel, give Thummim. 
Jonathan and Saul were selected, and the troops were cleared of the charge. Uh, <laughs> then, then Saul said, cast the lot between me and my son Jonathan. And Jonathan was selected. Saul commanded them, tell me what you did. Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff that I was carrying. I am ready to die. Um, the, it's, just, it's, it's so fast. It, by the way, your, your small group studies can, can have a blast with this Urim and, and Thummim bit, and you can just have fun with that. I'll, I'll leave you to your own devices on figuring out what that is. Um, I, anyway, uh, we, we could go for it for a while on that. Um, basically, there's a, a system of casting lots that they use to determine uh, you know, a, a way forward in this scenario. And so they, they begin to make this, this way forward. Uh, but, the, but the ultimate scenario here is Saul seems to be trying to rehearse the, the sin of Achan, kind of narrowing down the people of God to the right culprit. And, and his assumption is, like, I, me and my family, we're good. We're going to start kind of whittling down the people of Israel. But immediately as he starts, where does the finger get pointed? Boom, right back to his family. And I'm, I'm not going to tie up a lot of time here just to say, like, uh, you know, when, when we think the worst of others, we have to play up their failures. We have to look at the failures of others and try to find someone else. And, and here we have the finger of God pointed back at Saul's family. And so he has to then point the finger at Jonathan and say, uh, what, what have you done? He echoes the, the words of Samuel to himself. He, he points up the failures of others and in similar ways, I think when, when we begin to see distance from God in our lives, what do our conversations with our friends begin to look like? We begin to talk a lot about the mistakes and failures and sins of other people and struggle to talk about the successes and victories that we see in other people's lives because somehow we have to receive that moral high ground. We have to have that spiritual cover for the failures of our lives. Next, we see this threat that he has in verses 44 to 46. Saul declared to him, Jonathan, may God punish me and do so severely if you do not die, Jonathan. But the people said to Saul, must Jonathan die who accomplished such a great deliverance for Israel? No, as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, for he worked with God, uh, God's help today. So the people redeemed Jonathan, and he did not die. So Saul gave up pursuit of the Philistines, and the Philistines returned to their own country. We've reached that point where Jonathan becomes the one who has to die because of all of this calamity. I almost detect in, in the previous verses some, uh, uh, this isn't in the Hebrew, um, but this is in like the Phil translation. Like I almost detect some sarcasm, like, yeah, 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 Dad. I, I, yeah, I definitely, I stuck my staff into some honey. Yep, I need to die. Yep. For sure, let's do. It. Let's 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 get this on with. Like, there, there's almost that sense of okay, really, all right, whatever. Um, but but he's he's confident in, in the sense that he owns it, and he's like, this this is what sure, this is what needs to happen. And Saul, you know, he 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 can't even have this saintly son who's done all this stuff to gain a victory stand in his way. He's he's there ready to press on for Jonathan's death. Over, over a little bit of honey, over a little bit of God's goodness in his life. Are you kidding me? You know, we're, we know that we're distant from God when we become distant from the people of God. When that person who is that uh, gracious and godly person in your life becomes grating on your soul, it's not a sign that there's a problem wrong with that person. It's often a, a sign that something is wrong between you and God. If you think about the people that your life is moving you toward, if you look at the trajectory of your life and you look at, you know, these people that I'm developing deeper and deeper and deeper friendships with, and the people that I'm, I'm finding um, I, I, I need to set boundaries with and separate myself from, look at who those people are. Who is, who is my heart attracted to and moving toward? Am I threatened by the faithful or am I moving toward the faithful? This will give you a sign and a good gauge of whether you're moving toward or away from God. The last section is, is a wonderful little highlight reel of King Saul's life. It says, when Saul assumed the kingship over Israel, he fought against all enemies in every direction. against Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah, the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he caused havoc. He fought bravely, defeated the Amalekites, rescued Israel from all those who plundered them. Saul's son sons were Jonathan, Ishvi, 
and Mal- uh, <laughs> Malkashua. And the names of his daughters were Merab, his firstborn, Michael the younger. The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, daughter of Ahimaaz. And the name of the commander of his army was Abner, son of Saul's uncle, Nair. Saul's father was Kish. Abner's father was Nair, son of Abiel. The conflict with the Philistines was fierce all of Saul's days. So whenever Saul noticed a strong or valiant man, he enlisted him. We get here just, uh, if, if this was all you read of Saul's life, you might begin to think, well, you know, it seems like he was a pretty good dude. Like he achieved some victories, made some progress for the people of Israel. And, and you might begin to think that all he ever did was win, 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 win. Um, but what you're getting here is the best of the best of Saul. It's the, you know, wedding pictures that omit the, the pimply teenage pics in the, in the reel. It's, it's the curated highlight reel of Saul. And in some ways, it's meant to remind us that, yes, he did win some battles. But as the passage has pointed out, he never routed the enemies. Yes, his commanders had some successes, but he had to claim them as his own. He succeeded in a lot of little things but he never succeeded in the big things. And I wonder if the same might be true for us as we begin to distance ourselves from God and feel that separation from God in our own souls. If, if we had to curate the highlight reel of our successes, would we stack up a bunch of wins that don't really matter for the long haul? Or are we succeeding at the things that really matter? Loving God, loving others, walking with God, influencing others to do the same, what will the tombstone of your life look like? And like Saul, don't let distance from God be your legacy. Don't wake up five years from now flailing a mile out from shore, but instead, today, take stock of where you stand with God. How do I stand under the light of God's Word? One last thing as as we wrap up. At the end of the story, there's that neat little scenario that plays out with Jonathan and the people of God. And the people of God redeem Jonathan from his failure, his, his failure to keep that man-made command of the evil king. And, and there's so much in there that I think is, is very instructive for us. The people do for Jonathan what he could not do for himself. He, the people took on some sort of cost and ransomed the prince. Two things that we should take seriously. You know, there was a ransom that existed for Jonathan that did not exist for Saul. Jonathan was able to be redeemed for his failure to keep the oath of man. Saul was not able to be redeemed for failing to follow the law of God. Why is that? Jonathan owned the fact that he had messed up, the fact that he had created distance between himself and his dad by unknowingly breaking this oath. Saul never owned the fact that he was creating distance between himself and God. And the second thing is is the beauty of this picture. See, in, in this story, there is the prince who broke the oath of the evil king, and the people ransomed the prince back. Oh, but the Bible tells us a more beautiful story that comes where there comes this heavenly prince that comes not not to ransom himself, not to redeem himself, but to redeem us, God's people who had strayed far, far, far from God, who had broken the oath of the mighty king of heaven, and he restores us back to closeness with himself. See, in in, in the picture of Jonathan, we get to see the, the answer to the distance that we feel from God in our hearts, that God has provided a way for us to be brought back to shore, brought back to Himself. And in fact, we find ourselves, those those of us who have trusted in the Prince and His ransom, have been anchored in the harbor. And yeah, we we get blown around that harbor a little bit on on the chain that, that fixes us to the anchor of Christ, but we remain in the harbor. Our ships do not go derelict, those who have, have found themselves anchored to Christ. So I would encourage you this morning, the ransom of Jonathan, we get this little glimpse into the hope that exists for us, those of us who surrender ourselves to Christ and are anchored near to the heart of God. But in the unransomed Saul, 
we get a little glimpse of the danger that exists for those who surrender their lives to the currents of sin and are drawn out far from God. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? This morning, as you gather here this morning and we spend some time to reflect before we close, I would just encourage you to take inventory of those questions, of those uh, observations that we made through the, the passage. And if you're thinking through those and you begin to see, you know, I'm seeing a lot of myself in those observations. I'm seeing a lot of those things in my life that are uh, very concerning about the direction that my life is headed. Would you take a moment and just be honest before God and say, my, my heart has drifted far from you this morning. But would you, in that moment, turn your eye toward the prince, the prince of heaven who has taken the steps to redeem your soul back to God? And would you find hope in the work that he has done? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the prince who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, the one who has anchored our hearts in the harbor of your love. I pray that you would help us to, to want to be as close to you as we possibly can, to not let that anchor slip away from us, but, but to be drawn into harbor. Lord, I pray that we would pursue you in the same way that you have pursued closeness with us, that those of us who were far off, the book of Ephesians tells us, have been brought near through the blood of your Son. Lord, I pray that we would revel in the goodness of your grace this morning the hope that we have in Christ to be tethered to you. I pray that you would encourage us with the gospel and pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Phil. And so a couple things just to remind you of as you go out this, this morning. Um, this evening, we have what we call our family meeting. And so I want to encourage you um, to, to come and hang out with us this evening. Uh, we have a time of speaking about how we're going to, how we share our faith. We've got a couple of speakers um, to come and talk about that. I um, just want to encourage you in your day-to-day -day life, where you find yourself, um, to blossom where you're planted, to make much of Christ where you are. And so I want to encourage you in that. Um, but I uh, want to say that, you know, that's for everybody tonight. Um, anyone that's here, we're going to have a time for our, our children, for our youth, for our adults. We're going to have a share a meal together starting at 5. So, um, you know, come join us. Come hang out and enjoy that time with us. And um, I want to encourage you in that. And then secondly, I don't have a slide for this, but I want to encourage you, uh, those that are young professionals, young college, young married, those um, that uh, are, I know Carl and Anna have a, a group together, but um, Ken and Beth, you know, wave at me. Ken and Beth, we're, they're hosting a cookout next Sunday after church. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, make one of those three aware that you're coming. And um We'll sign you up, all right? So we want to make sure you're a part of that. So be a part of that. I want to encourage you in that. And then this morning as you go out, I want to encourage you to make much of, of Christ where you grow, everywhere you are, uh, to reflect him in all you think, say, and do. So I want to encourage you uh, to, as you go, the gospel goes with you. Keep that in mind. That's a big deal. I know we say that a lot. You hear that a lot around here. But I want to encourage you what that really looks like. That's, that's anything you do and everything you do. The gospel goes with you. We carry the hope of the gospel everywhere we go. And folks are looking for that. Um, I was reminded this week, I mean, there are so much going on. People are so full of rage. They're so full of looking for that hopeless, that they go through hopelessness, that we have the hope of the gospel. So let's make much of Christ as you go. Um, the gospel goes with you. You are dismissed. Yeah.